Well, tonight we're in chapters 4 and 5 here in the book of Ezekiel, and as we look at these verses, I have to be honest with you, as I've been going through them and reading them, they are really, really, really difficult. It's a difficult word that we're going to be looking at today. And so you'll see that as we read. So let's begin here in chapter 4, verse 1. I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8. You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it. Build a siege wall against it and heap up a mound against it. Set camps against it also and place battering rams against it all around. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity, for I have laid on you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Therefore, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem. Your arm shall be uncovered. You shall prophesy against it. And surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. Now, we need to remember that Ezekiel is a man whom God has called as a prophet, and God commanded him to act as a watchman. Now, remember in chapter 3, verse 17, remember how there it had said, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth. Give them warning from me. That was his responsibility as a prophet. He was to be there as a man watching and calling out a warning to those people who were behind the wall. So he was to be there crying out a warning to the nation of Israel. God was about to bring judgment, a continuation of judgment, a judgment on the nation because of the continual rejection of him and their continual rejection of his word. Instead of listening to God and obeying God, the nation of Israel had given themselves over to listening to false prophets and, and worshiping idols. And you see that in the writings of Ezekiel as well as his contemporaries. You see that in, in the book of Jeremiah. When you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah in chapter 2 verse 13 says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. And so he had stated that what they had done is they had rejected the living God in order that they might pursue a system that didn't have life within it. When God was speaking to the nation's false prophets, he said in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, now they have healed the hurt of my daughter, the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so when you see what was taking place during the time of Ezekiel as well as Daniel and, and Jeremiah, you see that the nation of Israel has, has retreated from a relationship with God and God is now bringing judgment upon them. These false prophets that were around at that time were promising peace when in reality God was saying through His true prophets, I am bringing judgment. He said, judgment is coming. Now we know that through... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, that God used Nebuchadnezzar as Nebuchadnezzar came against the nation of Judah, the southern tribes. We know that in 605 B.C. as well as 597 B.C. that Nebuchadnezzar had, had come against the nation and had devastated them. Well, what we're seeing now is, is God saying there's going to be a third time that he comes against you. So what is going on is God is saying you need to be a prophet to these people, a people who are rejecting me. And that's what we're seeing here in chapter 4. And so as we look at chapter 4 together, notice in verses 1 and 2 how it says, you also, son of man, take a clay tablet, lay it before you, and portray on it a city Jerusalem, lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it, set camps against it also, and place a battering, and place battering rams against it all around. 
So we know that God has stated to Ezekiel that he was going to be unable to speak until God loosed his tongue. And so what we have here is a visual. We have him using visuals to communicate. So he's going to make it clear that there's going to be no peace and that the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Notice verse 2, how it says that he's to take a, a clay tablet and he's to build a miniature city that is under siege. So that's intended to visually portray the third and final invasion of Babylon, which took place in 588 to 586 B.C. So that's what he's doing. He's portraying the reality that the nation is going to come under attack and that the city of Jerusalem is going to be, ha have a siege laid against it. He goes on in verse 3 to say the same kind of thing. Take for yourself an iron plate, set it as an iron wall between you and the city, set your face against it, and it shall be besieged and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. And so even though the false prophets at that time are saying destruction will not happen, destruction is inevitable because God has said this is going to take place. Now this pan that you see in verse 3, this, this plate, reveals the impossibility of escaping the siege. And it also is a portrait of the separation that has taken place between the nation of Israel and its God. If you take notes, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, speaks about this separation. Sin makes a separation between you and God. It's what breaks fellowship. According to Isaiah 59, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That's the answer sometimes to the question people have when they say, how come it seems that my prayers are not being listened to? Sometimes it's because I'm harboring a desire for sin in my life that makes a separation, and the fellowship issue has to be taken care of so that communication is once again restored, so that I can pray according to the will of the Father and receive those things that I've made requests of. Sometimes it's simply an issue of sin making a separation. In the particular case that we have here, when Ezekiel is there with this, this plate before him, it's a picture of the fact that no matter what the people do, they're not going to escape judgment. And it's a secondary picture of the fact that their sin has made that separation. So that judgment is coming, and judgment is inevitable. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, I've mentioned Jeremiah a couple of times already. In Jeremiah, the false prophets were speaking to those Jews who had been exiled. The false prophets were speaking to them, saying that they would soon return to Israel. And so Jeremiah, when he was speaking to the exiles, told the people not to listen to these false prophets because it's simply not true. Happy days are not just around the corner, is the point that he was making. He said in, in Jeremiah 27, 21, and 22, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem, they shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. He's saying, listen, the inevitability of the siege and the destruction is, is, is there. There's nothing that you can do about it. So don't listen, he is saying, to those false prophets that are saying peace because in reality there is no peace. Now, in verses 4 through 8, he says, lie on your left side and lay the iniquity uh, of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days. And then he goes on to say that there, he's to lay on his right side. So when he would lay on his left side, he's to be facing the north. So laying on his left side, facing the north, is the direction of the ten northern tribes. When he lays on his right side, he's facing south towards the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And the point he's making very simply is that Israel sinned for a longer period of time than the two southern tribes, and, and therefore they're going to be receiving great judgment. So God's patience has come to an end, and he's about to bring judgment. When he says in verses 7 and 8, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. The arm uncovered reveals a readiness for battle. It, it speaks of, uh, 
of, of no escape being possible. So there's no reason to believe that he was lying on his side continuously, but he was lying on his side daily as a visual portrayal of the judgment that is about to come upon the nation. Now, in verse 9, continuing, he says, Take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, that sounds good to me, <laughs> lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days, you shall eat it. Your food which you eat shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day. That's about eight ounces. From time to time you shall eat it. You shall also drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hin, not Benny hin, of a hin. From time to time you shall drink it. That's less than a quart of water. And you shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. Then the Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles where I will drive them. So I said, Ah, oh Lord God, indeed I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. He said to me, See, I am giving you cow dung instead of human waste, you shall prepare your bread over it. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and shall drink water by measure and with dread, that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity." Very cheery words. The siege is going to last about 18 months. Food is going to be scarce. There's going to be the need to mix various grains. And a daily ration is going to be eight ounces of bread and less than a quart of water. And so he's telling him that there are going to be conditions that are very terrible. Now, in verse 13, when it says, The Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread. The bread is called defiled because it's baked over human waste that is being used as fuel. So the idea, obviously, is repulsive, but it is also something that is polluting, and that's why it's called defiled. It's interesting how the Old Testament actually has bathroom regulations. You see that in Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 through 14. And it gives regulations relating to bathroom habits. And human waste is, is regarded as being defiled, and that's the picture. What you have here is a picture of humiliation, and you have a picture of ritual defilement. Now, this is where it gets practical. I want to develop this with you for just a moment. We need to remember something about the nation of Israel. Perhaps you've already taken this note, Exodus 19, verse 6. Important scripture, because the nation of Israel was to be a picture of a separate and a sanctified people. The nation of Israel was to be a bright and a holy light in a world that is filled with darkness. When God was speaking in Exodus 19, verse 6, He said, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So in a, a time and in, in a world that was filled with darkness, the nation of Israel was to be a holy light that would shine brightly in the midst of all of that polluted darkness. That was the purpose of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was to be a nation that brought glory to God. And so what God did is He gave to them rules and He gave to them regulations. You find those rules and regulations in the Old Testament. Now recently I was teaching a passage where the question was asked of Jesus Christ, by a scribe, a, a legal expert in the law of Moses. What is the great command in the law? When the scribe had approached the Lord Jesus and asked that question, he basically was just exemplifying what was typical during the time of Christ. They were theological nitpickers, constantly trying to find what is the most important law 
out of all the laws that, that were given to the nation of Israel. Now, when you study your Bible, sometimes you may be thinking in terms of the law, and if I say, well, the law of Moses, many people immediately will imagine that I'm speaking simply of what we call the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. You find that in Exodus 20 and various other passages, the Ten Commandments. But the fact is, is the rabbis during the time of Christ had already accepted that there were more than 10 commandments. They actually had found that there are some 613 commandments. 613, 248 positive, 365 negative. And what they had done is they had broken them down into 613 specific laws. That's why when this young rabbi, rather scribe, approaches Jesus Christ, he wants to know what the great commandment, if you can sum up in one commandment, what is the great commandment, what would it be? That was something they did regularly during that time because the nation of Israel was a nation of law. The nation of Israel was to be a light in darkness. The nation of Israel was to live a separated life, a sanctified life, a holy life. They were to be a bright light in the midst of spiritual darkness, and the laws that God had given to them were intended to cause people to visually see that these people actually worshipped a different God, a living God. That's how it worked during that time. That's how it's supposed to work during our time. Jesus, when he was asked the question, what is the great commandment, had an immediate answer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. And you are to love the Lord thy God with everything that is within you, your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, everything. And there's a second like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What did Jesus say was the most important thing? What was the law's purpose? Well, you can see that in the New Testament, there are a variety of things that Paul writes concerning what the purpose of the law was. But one of the things he says concerning the law was that the law was a schoolmaster intended to bring people to a faith in Jesus Christ because Paul told the Romans that he wouldn't have known what certain sins were had the law not been given, which awakened in him the reality and knowledge of the fact that he was lying or coveting or whatever it was because the law said, thou shalt not do that. He says, and upon discovering that the law says I'm not to do something, I also discover a law within me that says I want to lie, I want to steal, I want to covet, I want to do those things. He says, and that's why I'm desperate and in need of a Savior. The nation of Israel was to be a nation separated to God. And the ordinances that God had given to that nation were to be obeyed by the nation so that they might shine as a light. Now, I was mentioning recently, while in Israel, we were in a place called Bet Shan. Bet Shan is a ruin. It's a, it's a, it's a ruins of a, of a once great and powerful uh, city that had been basically developed by the Romans. And in this particular city called Bet Shan, which is in northern Israel, they had baths, they had, uh, a, uh, they had a mall, they had a, uh, gymnasiums. They had a variety of things there in Bet Shan. They had an arena for their athletic contests and a variety of things. It was a very modern, beautiful city that was ultimately destroyed by an earthquake. But what had happened is the Romans, who were great borrowers, had borrowed the philosophy and religion of the Greeks. And so they had brought in the value system of the Greek religion. Now, remembering that the Greek religion was a system that basically said, eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you're going to die with no sense of the infinite, with no sense of the future, with no sense of eternity, no, with no sense of a, of a single personal God who would bring you into judgment. And they had this mentality that you might as well party hardy because you're going to die, so enjoy as much as you can right now. And that came into an incredible clash with the mentality of the religious Hebrews who, who were taught that you're just passing through. You're supposed to be a light in darkness. You follow the rules and laws of God and have a relationship with Him through sacrifice, anticipating this, the sending of Messiah who's going to fulfill all the promises of God. Therefore, don't grab hold of things and hold tightly to them because they're not going to last. That mentality came into a conflict with the Greek way of thinking, which we have to this day the same kind of thing. To this day, God has said to the church of Jesus Christ, you're to be a light. You are the light of the world, Jesus Christ said. You are a city on a hill. Now, when you're in Israel and you go to the place where the Sermon on the Mount is given, you can actually look in the hillsides around you and you can see that there is a, one city that is above other cities. 
And taking into consideration there were no street lamps or anything like that during the time of Christ, you could be seated there in the dark in a valley and you can look up and you can see a city on a hill because of the lights that are there surrounding or giving off the light there from various houses and all. And, and Jesus would be pointing that out. In the darkness, you will always be able to see the light because the light shines brightly in the darkness. Therefore, you, the church, are the city on the hill. You, the church, are to be the light in darkness. That's something that God had stated to the nation of Israel through the rules and regulations and their obedience thereof. They were to be people that were, were honoring God and living lives that God was pleased with. That's what God has called us to in the 21st century. That's what the church is supposed to do. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't do that. Many times we, we fail to realize the importance of something like that. But God had said to the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You're going to have a relationship with me. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, he said to them, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. God said, I am making you a treasure, my own specific, beautiful wife. But instead of caring about that, they rejected him. Instead of caring about honoring him and obeying him and being blessed because they did, they rejected him. They chose to become even worse than the heathen nations around them. And God is bringing judgment against them. Now, when the Lord is speaking to Ezekiel saying this is what's about to take place and, and as a symbol of the defilement, you're going to be using human, uh, human waste as, as fuel, uh, he just, uh, Ezekiel got really upset. Notice verse 14, uh, I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, indeed I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I've never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. He's, he is horrified at the thought of doing so. I, I'm a priest, and I'm the son of a priest from a line of priests. I, I've always kept the dietary laws. Even the thought of eating something that's not kosher is repulsive to me. I, I'm incapable of compromising. I, I, I don't see how I, I can do that. And, and as he's saying that to the Lord, which I find very interesting, I mean, God is saying you're to do this, and he's arguing with God about it. God graciously concedes. So he allows him to use cow dung, for fuel. He says finally in verse 16 and 17, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, shall drink water by measure and with dread, that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity. Now, the affliction, and this is an important point, the affliction that they're about to endure is intended to instill dismay in the people. It, it is intended to cause them to sorrow over their sin. You know, this is an unpopular thought in the 21st century, but chastening is supposed to be painful. It's supposed to cause you to be unhappy. It, it's supposed to, to make you say, I don't want to go through that again. I don't know about you, but I wasn't one who wanted to get spanked a second time. I mean, if my dad got mad at me, I wasn't going to invite a second spanking. You know, that was just not my way. Now, my dad normally didn't spank me anyway. My dad just couldn't, he didn't have the heart to do it. You know, my dad would take me by the hand. I can, he only spank, I, I, I only remember, I remember less than five spankings from my father in my entire life. My dad didn't spank me, and it's because he pitied me. It's because he would take me by the hand and put his hand back to, to let me have it, and I would start dancing, and I would turn towards his hand so that he might injure me, and, and my dad, before you know it, would be laughing, and he'd let me go, and he'd say, don't do it again. I mean, I did that till I was 40 years old. <laughs> I got away with it for years. Chastening is supposed to make you say, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to endure that again. I don't want that kind of affliction again. I don't want to pay that price again. That's what it's supposed to do in your life. It's supposed to make you say, I don't want to go through that. And that's what the Lord is bringing on the nation. 
He's bringing to them an awareness. It, it says in, in Hebrews 12, 11, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And so God is bringing this, and it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to cause them great pain so that they will have a great repentance. Well, moving on into chapter 5 and continuing, he says, And you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take it as a barber's razor, pass it over your head and your beard, then take scales to weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn with fire one-third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. Then you should, shall take one-third and strike around it with the sword, and one-third you shall scatter in the wind. I will draw out a sword after them. You shall also take a small number of them, bind them in the edge of your garment, then take some of them again and throw them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From there a fire will go out into all the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. She's rebelled against my judgments by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries that are all around her. For they have refused my judgments, and they have not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that are all around you have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my judgments, nor even done according to the judgments of the nations that are all around you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, indeed I, even I, am against you and will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations." And I will do among you what I have never done and the like of which I will never do again because of all your abominations. Now, when he speaks concerning shaving his hair and all of that, it's intended to illustrate the, the humiliation that they're about to suffer through Babylon. They're going to be suffering through fire, the sword, exile. Verse 3 tells us a small remnant is going to be spared, but many of them will be scattered as exiles. Now, it's interesting, and I want to make a point of this. Verse 3, you shall take a small number of them and bind them in the edge of your garment. It seems that even in times of great carnality and great apostasy, that there remains what could be called a remnant, a small amount of people who have remained faithful to God. When you look in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, you're introduced to a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah was one of the fantastic prophets of the Old Testament. He's a man who it's recorded was used by God to perform some seven miracles and is very well known for praying that the heavens would be stopped and then praying again so that rain might fall after three and a half years of drought. He's a man who's known for a variety of things in Scripture. But one of the things that is most famous about Elijah is his famous battle with the false prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. And you see that story in 1 Kings in chapter 18, how that he had challenged these false prophets to see who is the true God. You know the story. There were some 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And as they had this battle between him representing the true God and, and these 850 combined number of false prophets, he had said, let's see what God will answer prayer. You put a sacrifice on an altar, I'll put one in one, and, and, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. You know the story. And so all day long, the false prophets began to cry out to their false God and, and cried out so that this God might answer. And, and, and the God was silent, of course. And, and so in the, midst of, in the middle of the day, they began to cut themselves with lances and poured out blood and cried out all day. And, and there's the prophet Elijah watching this take place. And and ultimately, he begins to mock them. Perhaps your God is on a journey. He may be in the bathroom. He may be at, he's just not noticing you. He begins to mock them. Then he says, okay, this is what we'll do. They dig a pit, 
They fill it with water. They put the offering in it. They make sure that the water is overflowing. And he's, he just looks up to heaven and, and says, God, you're God. And, and, and God sends fire and, and, and consumes that offering. It's a very famous story. There's a monument there on Mount Carmel uh, reminding us that this is what took place there. And then when God answered by fire, the, the children of Israel are seeing this take place and they begin to yell out the Lord God. He is God. And what happens is ultimately he takes and actually um, enacts capital punishment on the false prophets. And, and then Jezebel and Ahab become aware of what has taken place. And Ahab says, what, what Elijah has done to the prophets, I'm going to do to him. I'm going to kill him. And you know the story how he runs out of fear. And as he runs out of fear, he's concerned that he's going to be taken and he's depleted and all emotion. And the Lord feeds him and sends him off into the wilderness. And for 40 days, he, he is sustained by the meal that he was given and all. And, and now he's there in a cave and he's afraid and he doesn't know what's going on. And, and there's a wind, but the Lord isn't in the wind. And there's an earthquake, but the Lord isn't in the earthquake. And then there's a fire, and the Lord is not in the fire. But the Bible says... The Lord speaks to him in a still, small voice and begins to minister to this man. What's your problem? I'm alone. And God, in response to him when he says, I'm alone, says in 1 Kings 19, verse 18, God says, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You're not alone. In the midst of all of these people, you can feel overwhelmed. You can feel outnumbered. We as believers in Jesus Christ undoubtedly can feel that. Undoubtedly we feel that. I mean, all you need to do is look at the news. There are people who call certain acts of sacrilege and desecration works of art, and they get funded for doing those things. And I can't go into the things that they do. Some of you read your newspapers and you're aware of what I could refer to. But they call them works of art. But they're actually sacrilegious. They're things that are, are absolutely in opposition to our Christian faith. And they do it and they get away with it. They, they make movies about Jesus portraying him as a sinner, portraying him as a homosexual, portraying him as having a love affair with Mary Magdalene. They make movies like that. And, and, and if you stand up and say, that's wrong, they say, well, don't be so thin-skinned. This is a free country. But you never see them do anything like that about Muhammad. Of course they wouldn't do anything like that about Muhammad because his followers aren't like us. And they know that they could end up with a fatwa, they could end up with a death penalty, they could end up assassinated, killed, butchered, beheaded. So naturally, they choose to do that against Christians. We know this. I'm speaking to a group of people who's familiar with the reality of that. And you can feel that you're all alone. You can feel, I'm on the job site, and I'm the only believer. There's nobody else in the world who loves you, Jesus, except for me. You can feel that way. And the Lord says to you, you don't love me either. What are you talking about? No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> But you can feel that. Have you ever felt that? You're in a classroom in college and you've got 29 other students with you and it seems that every one of them doesn't believe what you believe in. You're by yourself. Your professor stands up and makes statements about your faith and you feel left out. You feel alone. You feel rejected. You feel stupid. You feel ignorant. You feel like an intellectual hillbilly. You feel like, you know, what's this all about? You can feel that way. Even this great nation that is founded on Christian principles has faded away from those things over the years and we know that. We know that. But you want to know something? In the midst of the darkness, you're going to shine much, much more brightly. When we were in uh, Israel, we were in region of the Dead Sea. And uh, we stay in a particular hotel there that is something like 22 stories high. It's a good, you know, by California standards, that's tall. Not by New York standards, but by California standards, that's tall. And my room, Marie and my room, was on the 15th floor. And there were some in our group that were on the 17th floor. And we were supposed to be at the bus at 10 o'clock. And there was a, a storm, and the power went out. And then the generator that was to back up and produce energy shorted. But we have to leave. 
And now you're 15 floors up, and you've got to get your, your luggage down. And the elevators aren't working. And so we're walking down with our bags, you know. And, you know, Marie does not pack lightly. <laughs> and we're carrying these bags down all these flights. And we get the bags down, but as we're going up, some of the hallways there that you're coming down, because you're coming down the stair, the emergency stairwells, the lights aren't on. It is pitch black in there. And if you're anything like me, I'm night blind. I can't see a step in front of me in the dark. I can't. But you know, I had taken this little pocket. It's not even a pocket. It actually attaches to my belt loop. It, it's my, uh, a watch. But the watch had a little, little uh, button on it when you push it, and a light will shine from it. But it does, it's, it's useless. I mean, in this room, if I were to hold it up and, and, and try to show you the light, you, wouldn't, you couldn't see it. There's, there's lights on but man, was that light bright in the darkness. And boy, did I need that. And I stood there in the, in, the, in the stairwell as people sometimes were coming down, bringing their bags, and I just turned the light on. And when I pushed that little light, you could hear people saying, thank you so much, because they couldn't see it was dark. In the darkness, even a small light shines brightly and can save a life. And you know what? We're living in darkness right now. We're living in darkness. But instead of giving in to it, we ought to be shining more bright, brightly. We ought to be living in a way that people say, you believe in something in a world that believes in nothing. You have a hope that's real, not in the government, but in something greater than that. Where'd your hope come from? You believe in change, I believe in change, but I believe in transformation. I believe that God will change my life. And he does that through Jesus Christ, you see. And so the nation of Israel had walked away from a God, a God who could transform people's lives. And so you can get to the point where you're starting to think, I'm the only person, and God say, no, there's going to be a remnant. And that's what we are. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, we're to become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The nation of Israel was supposed to have been that. Well, he says in verses 5 through 9, Thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. She's rebelled against my judgments by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries that are all around her. They have refused my judgment and they have not walked in my statutes. And therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that are all around you, have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my judgments, nor even done according to the judgments of the nations that are all around you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, indeed, I, even I, am against you and will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations, and I will do among you what I've never done, and the like of which I will never do again because of all your abominations. Instead of being a city on a hill, as a nation, you have exceeded pagan nations in your wickedness and idolatry. And therefore, I'm holding you in a greater accountability because God's judgment is poured out dependent on spiritual knowledge, spiritual privilege, and spiritual opportunity. The more you know, the more you're responsible for. In Luke 12, 48, Jesus said, Everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. You have my laws, he is saying to them. You're aware of what I have commanded, and you've rejected me, so I'm holding you accountable. Now, to show you the severity of what takes place, verses 10 and 11, therefore, fathers shall eat their sons in your midst. Sons shall eat their fathers. I will execute judgments among you. All of you who remain, I'll scatter to all the winds. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, Surely, 
because you have defiled my sanctuary with your detestable things and with all your abominations. Therefore, I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. God is being true to his word. God already warned them, and they were familiar with this, by the way. If you take notes, it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In verses 52 and 53, he had said, if you don't obey me, your enemies will besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land. And they shall, shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. You're going to be starving to death to the point where you're going to eat your own children. When Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem, this is what took place. In the book of Lamentations, in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it reads, The tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets. Those who were brought up in scarlet embrace ash heaps. The punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment with no hands to help her. And in verse 10, he continues by saying, the hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now, in verses 12 through 17, as we're about to close, one-third of you shall die of the pestilence, be consumed with famine in your midst. One-third shall fall by the sword all around you. I will scatter another third to all the winds. I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall my anger be spent. I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be avenged, and they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have spent my fury upon them. Moreover, I will make you a waste and a reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by. So it shall be a reproach, a taunt, a lesson, and an astonishment to the nations that are all around you when I execute judgments among you in anger and in fury, in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I send against them the terrible arrows of famine, which shall be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you. I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. So I will send against you famine and wild beasts, and they will bereave you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Cheery, isn't it? God simply is reiterating what he had earlier said. They need to understand that the judgment that is coming and the conditions that they'll find themselves in, well, this all comes from him. It's interesting to note, and I want you to see this. He repeats this three times. Notice verse 13. He says, I, the Lord, have spoken it. Notice in verse 15, I, the Lord, have spoken and then again in verse 17, I, the Lord, have spoken. This is coming from me. And why would he be doing that? This judgment that God is bringing on the nation is to impress upon them how greatly God hates idolatry. God says, I am not going to tolerate your unfaithfulness. I am going to respond with anger and I respond with fury. The nation of Israel had taken the glorious name of God, dragged it through the mud, brought shame to his name, and as a result, God brought judgment on them. It's interesting in the book of Romans, in chapter 2 in the New Testament, how Paul says in verses 23 and 24, he says, you who make your boast in the law, speaking to Jews, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. 
the holy name of God, the name of God that is above all names, the name of God that every knee shall bow before, those who were supposed to have honored and lived in such a way as people would know that they feared their God had caused the pagans, the unsaved people of the world, to mock the faith of Israel and to mock the God of Israel. As I read the Old Testament, I, I can't help but ask the Lord, is there any application to me in this age, in this time, I mean, this time of the church? And well, God's name is holy in both the old and the new. And God's intent is for me to live a, a life that brings glory and honor to Him. And Jesus said that. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and, and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So Jesus made it very clear that, that his followers were to live in such a way uh, that, that people would actually come to realize that, that our God, he is God. And again, that's why when that scribe had come to Christ and said, what is the great commandment? That's why Jesus said, love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Because when you love God, it's going to have some effect on the way you live. And so, you're going to be one who not only worships God in spirit and truth, but you're going to be willing to lay your life down for a friend you're going to be willing to be a servant counted as someone who is, is no longer your own. And you're going to have a life that is so different that people will be able to tell just by the way you live that there's something in your life that is greater than the desire for now. You'll have an eternal perspective. There's going to be something about you. There's going to be a gravity about you. There's going to be a sobriety about you. There's going to be this sense of otherworldliness about you. There's going to be some kind of sense that, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And then the world, if they will make an accusation against you, are going to be ashamed because what they're saying will be false because your life is pure before God and before them. That's how it works in Christianity. And it's all wrapped up in a single word, love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. The God with everything that is within you. Why should I love God with everything that is within me? Why should I love him like that? I love God with everything that is within me because God has demonstrated how much he loves me. And I respond to his love. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. The Bible says God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the meaning of this season is, by the way, isn't it? I mean, this is the Easter season where we, the church, remember the deep love of God that was demonstrated to us through him sending his own son to die on the cross for us. I have two sons and a grandson. There's absolutely no way on God's green earth that I would ever even consider giving my sons up or my grandson up. If somebody said, listen, there needs to be a blood transfusion in your sons or your grandsons, the only person who has the, the kind of blood is a very important person who's going to die if you don't give them all the blood that's in your children's body, any son, either son or my grandson, I'd say, well, you know what? I'll do his funeral for him because I'm not going to give you my son. I'm sorry. I'm not going to give you my son. That's my son. You think that I would take my son and let him be bled so that somebody who doesn't even care about him or me can go on living? Are you kidding me? No way. Sorry, he's going to die. That's the way it's going to be. That's the truth. I'd like to be noble and say, oh, I'd give up my sons. No, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't give up my son. I wouldn't give up my grandson. Are you kidding me? That's what's so amazing about the love of God. Because while we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Even though God knew the overwhelming majority of the world would rejoice at the death of his son and not care about it whatsoever, he still gave his son for us. The amazing, amazing love of God. And because of the love of God, I live a life that's different. Not because I'm trying to obey rules and regulations to somehow earn spiritual brownie points so that God might allow me perhaps into heaven because I tried hard. No, the things that I do that honor God are things that are actually motivated by a simple gratitude and a love for Jesus Christ. That's how it works. But the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel didn't love God. Even the pagans lived by their own codes and lived a better life than the people of God. And God said, I'm bringing judgment on you. I'm going to make you a waste and a reproach amongst the nations. He finally says in verses 16 and 17, when I send against them the terrible arrows of famine which shall be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you, I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. I will send against you famine, wild beasts, and they will bereave you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. In the midst of all of that, I can't help but think of a, of a prophet by the name of Habakkuk. Habakkuk wrote some 607 years before Christ. And Habakkuk in chapter 3, verse 2, said, O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Well, you know what? God, bringing it into the, our time, God did remember mercy in the midst of his wrath. Because the one who doesn't know the Lord, the wrath of God is on that person continually. But at the same time, God has made it possible for that wrath to be removed, and that comes through a faith in Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of his wrath, God does remember mercy. And that's why we're here today. It's because the Lord is merciful, but he is also holy. And as we read the book of Ezekiel, we are actually seeing the heart of God and how he doesn't see sin as being something small or something not to be concerned about or it's no big deal. God says, your sin is so great, I'm going to deal with you according to the measure of your sin. And so for those who might think it's no big deal to lie and steal and cheat on your wife or go out on your, your husband, and do the variety of things that we can find ourselves doing, saying it's no big deal, we need to remember that indeed it is a big deal and that it cost God a price that none of us have ever been willing to pay, the price of his own son, to ransom us, to purchase us, to show us how great sin is and what great cost it exacts. And so instead of taking it lightly, it humbles us and makes us grateful because God has loved us and saved us. But we ought to live as if we understand that and believe it.